Good morning. I'm so happy to have the Ruth experience, at least two of the three of the Ruth experience on my podcast again today. I first interviewed uh, Julie and Kendra and Kristen of the Ruth experience back in my first year of podcasting when it was called Make It Count Living a Legacy Life. And as you know, if you've been listening, it's now Welcome Heart Living a Legacy Life, which fits all the uh, legacy parts of who we want to be as followers of Christ. And I'm so happy that Julie and Kendra get to be with me today. And they're going to talk about their latest book, but these are high powered women. I just want you to know, um, really, I'm so impressed with them. For one thing, they let me uh, write on their blog years ago, which was very nice of them in my early writing days. And uh, they do have welcoming hearts. And so I probably should be quiet. But I do want to say that um, Julie is an adjunct professor in law and she's, are you a retired attorney? Would you call yourself a t- retired or do you have to get your license again every year? Like I, I, it's, I'm an inactive um, status attorney. So I still have my license. I huh. just pay a reduced amount. So I don't have to, so because yeah. I'm not going into court. Yeah. And we're, not we're not going to call her retired yet. <laughs> yeah. So what did you call it? Reduced and inactive. I, I think we can never get that name as a mother. I'm never going to be reduced and inactive. My mother, my kids keep calling me and Kendra, you have worked, um, with, uh, were you a circle, social worker or you still mm-hmm. are? Yeah. I, I am like heart. Julie. I pay a reduced fee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I technically still have my clinical license. So yes. Social your voice, worker. your your voice cut out there for a minute. So you're still oh, there, right? Okay, okay I Just am. Make sure you're strong. We want to hear your stories, but um, I think to be a social worker is the hardest job in the world. Be, you know, besides being a mother. Yeah, because it's challenging. It's so heartbreaking. That's mm-hmm. how I feel. Anyway, I've seen enough movies, and my sister was a foster mom for a while, and it's not easy. You know, people have the best intentions who go into social work. Hopefully, they do because they don't get paid a lot. And, uh, and then the people that they connect with, oh, I know we just finished 15 seasons of Heartland. That's why we know about social work. <laughs> yeah. I should not admit that we watch that. My girls come home and visit. They go, turn that off. It's such bad acting, but my husband and I enjoyed it. Okay. So you are a trio of strong women whose mission is to teach really the next generation, how to be kind. That's what your first book was about. Mm-hmm. So, um, but you have a new one out and I would like you to Tell us about how it came about, what's the name of the book, and what's going on with that. So our newest book is called One Good Word a Day, 365 Invitations to Encourage, Deepen, and Refine Your Faith. And this is for all of the girls, me included, who like failed at having a word of the year. So (laughs) I would pick a word of the year, right? And I'd be super excited. And then by like May, I was like, what's that word? (laughs) I, I, this is embarrassing. My mentor who has mentored me, what, 25 years, she keeps trying anyway. One time for my birthday, which is in May, she gave me a card and she wrote in it. This is for your word for the year. And I had no idea what she was talking about. I couldn't remember. And it was only May, you know, I thought I'm not going to tell her that. I hope she doesn't listen to this one, but yes, I totally get it. So explain, uh, maybe Kendra explain the concept of a word of the year, because not everybody knows about that. Sure, sure. So there's uh, a lot of different people who've written on this idea of picking a word of the year, which the idea behind it is great. And, and if you can stick with it, it's amazing. So maybe you pick the word light or joy or peace um, for your word for the year. And then you kind of use that as you go throughout your year, you know, how, how it resonates in your life and circumstances and things. But for a lot of us, like Julie said, we can kind of forget what our word of the year is. The other thing that I like about the one good word a day is that although a lot of the words are very uplifting and encouraging, there are some more challenging words mixed in there as well. So we have words like lament and Mm -hmm. grief and kind of running the gamut of all of the emotions or things that we would experience as people. Um, but you only have to hold those words for a day too. So (laughs) then you get to kind of move on to other things. So it, it feels in some ways almost more rounded to me because, um, you get to go from some really, really strong, encouraging, great words to also maybe some that might challenge or push you out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Um, and what, why did you think this was a good idea 
to write this book? Is it for women only or is it for men as well? Or is it for young people? What was your audience? Our audience is, it's probably primarily to women simply because we are women writing about our lives and our experiences. And so um, absolutely a guy could pick it up and read it. I just don't know how much, I don't know if it would resonate with him the same way. But we've had people, I know several families that use our books for their whole family. So a mom will pick it up and then they'll read our book um, around the kitchen table, either for breakfast or dinner or something. And so it can absolutely be for your kids, as long as I think you have an adult to just unpack it a little bit and start the conversation around it. But our primary audience, like we, we have a particular woman, we have a picture of her that we write to. And so, you know, she's, so it's a she. And she's, and she's older than, you know, 18. Well, I went to your website again, and I hope people will check you out on your website, which is the Ruth experience.com. And in your biography, it says that uh, you wanted to create kinship between, between women. And how did that original, why don't you go back to that story? We did cover it a little bit, but that was a year and a half ago. So I don't expect anybody to remember episode 40, though, I do want um, listeners, if you want to hear some more about how that got started, but is a desire to create kinship between women. How did that lead to really a kindness revolution? I think that, I think it started because the three of us were looking for, you know, we, I mean, we talk about legacy, right? We were looking for a way to create legacy within our own families. What do we want to, and maybe we didn't have this lofty of a goal to start, but it was sort of this idea of like, what do we want to, what do we want to instill in our children? What do we want our families to be known for? And, and we just decided as we started kind of on this journey of kindness, that probably other women are experiencing kind of the same feelings and frustrations and just desires within themselves to want to leave something for their kids. And, and so that's really kind of where kindness started. Um, it started because we wanted to, we wanted to implement it with our own kids. And so we thought, how are we going to do this practically in a way that makes sense? And then once we did, we were like, you know what? Other women probably are going to want some of these same kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. And so that's really where that came from. I'm, I'm just intrigued by the word kindness. And I know we're going back on your earlier books, but why of all the, for one thing, I don't think every woman thinks about what legacy do I want to leave my children? They're just trying to get them to school at the right school at the right time. After I yes. had my third one, I sort of like would forget that I had to get another school to go to or three soccer games on the same day at three different fields. I mean, I don't think I was thinking legacy. I was thinking survival and hoping I wouldn't lose my temper by dinner. So I don't think everybody thinks that way, but I think going back to this kinship between women, I think that when we're together, like you three together, friends, that's when you go, but what I really want to do is to have a legacy and we take this deep breath. So I think that's, don't you feel like your books and also the way that actually you've lived your lives uh, is an encouragement and an inspiration for other women to sit back and go, hey, there's more to life than making sure that there are the four, you know, the four food groups on their plate. Mm -hmm. It gives us an opportunity to dream a little. It gives us a space to dream a little. What with does? other women, what does Which, um, being in relationship, being in kinship, mm -hmm. it gives us this opportunity. It gives us a place to, well, first it gives us a place to say, you too. I thought I was alone. Like, oh, yes. I thought I was the only one, you know, crying at the end of the day because parenting is, can be so rough sometimes. Um, so first that, but then also, you know, this opportunity to dream a little and say, gosh, this is what I would love to see, or this is what I want for my kids, or this is what I want for my family. Mm. Um, and in kindness for us, it started, I mean, Kendra's exactly right, but it was really this idea of how, what the question we were wrestling with was, how do we make a intangible, sometimes invisible faith tangible and concrete for our very, very young children. They were too young to really hold this concept of God well. And so kindness was how we connected, you know, our five-year-olds to God first. Wow. wow. Hmm. And then later when they understood more that they were being, there were consequences for their actions, would they say, but you're not being kind, mommy. 
Did they ever oh, I've been over? called out. Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes rightfully so. Sometimes, I'm, sometimes like, I'm not kind either. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should have handled that differently or I should have yes. handled that better. And then right. we have a great conversation about redemption and right. repentance. And- right, right. Now, when you wrote this new book about a word of the day, and I wanted to make sure that this was clear. I think some people resist a word of the day, just like they resist uh, making a new year's resolution you know, or even making um, goal lists. I talk a lot about personal goals. And the reason I can is because I'm so bad at it. And so I can really uh, identify with those who can't find their to do list to even do their to do list. So um, I feel like I'm a good teacher in that way, not a great example, but a good teacher. So um, the idea of a word really is to guide is it to add structure to my life? Like my goal, my word of the day is a a year is a strange one. It's focus. And the idea is to focus on God. I pick a verse to go along with it uh, in Hebrews to to fix your eyes on Christ. Mm -hmm. So that will help me when I'm saying, well, Lord, I have those other things to do. And is this really fixing my eyes on Christ? And that's how it helps me. So um, in your, in writing the book, how did you know which words to pick? I mean, that's a lot of words, 360. It seems like a lot until you get to the end and then you realize there was oh, a could. lot more words we could oh. have picked from. Are you going to do volume two so, in two years? I don't know. We always kind of feel that way when we finish a book. Yes. It's like, even with kindness, it's like, man, we could probably write a whole nother kindness book. It's been enough years, but wow. I think what we tried to do was take words from different categories and different places in our lives. So for example, Mm -hmm. words that had to do with dreams or goals or ambitions we might have, um, words that had to do with our faith, um, relationships, friendships, um, raising kids, all of these, we tried to look at what are all of the different areas of our lives or that people could be in. And then let's try to pick some words and different things so that we're not just pigeonholing and we're only dealing with one specific kind of topic over and over again. And so I feel like that's really where a lot of the words came from, but it's true by the end, you know, the last round, I think we were all saying, okay, are there any words that really we haven't done yet that are at the top of the list that still need to be written about because we really wanted it to be well-rounded. So hopefully people don't get bored (laughs) with it partway through the year. Now, um, how did you, did you each say, okay, I'll do a third or did you do, did you get together and do each chapter together? We break it into, we each do a third. So oh, wow. um, yeah, we have Google Docs. So we have, we have like this whole system because this is now our fourth devotional, well, fifth, sixth, sixth devotional. Is that wow. right, Kendra? Or am I, I don't know. More? I don't know. But we've done it this way long enough that we have systems in place okay. where we each get, you know, a, a, roughly a third. And then we write, so we write independently together is okay. what we end up doing. So you're going to read, you know, Kendra's stories and you're going to read Kristen's stories and you'll read my stories. And we, we put our names on them because people, we've had people say that they like to guess, like they'll cover our name up and then they like to guess who is the author of the That's day. So and then cute. we also have people say that they can tell without even needing to see your name. So, but that's the process that we go through mm-hmm. behind the scenes. And then we'll, and then we'll trade. Like if Kendra has something, she really feels she needs to say, on about a word. Christmas day. Yes. You know, then we'll just switch spots mm-hmm. depending on sort of what's coming up or what words or what ideas people have on their heart. Now, just a practical, practical thing under books on your website. I just saw four books, but you just mentioned six devotionals. We so. have, so we have mm-hmm. self-published book as books as well. That should be on there. Oh, so there's, oh, oh. yeah, we have several, how many books have we written, Julie? Oh my goodness. Seven. We're, I, See, here's where we get confused. We're in the process of writing more books. So then it gets confusing. It's like, yes. wait, how many have we written, but we're writing another one. So what's the actual number? Hmm. Right. It's, okay. Well, I'll let people just Google you. Um, yes. I would like to ask each of you, which word meant the most to you personally? How did it change your life when you were writing it? Ooh. I'm sorry. I didn't give you any I didn't tell you I was going to ask that because I just thought of it. That was a trick question. That was really good though. Um, you want me to start? 
She's sure. obviously ready. So I, well, I can't, okay. I don't want to have the book in front of me. I can't think of a specific word, but I'll tell you the theme that was good for me because it challenged me the most. The themes that had to do with hospitality. So this idea of inclusion or inviting other people in, mm. I didn't, I, I grew up with wonderful parents, but it wasn't part of our family's habits to have people in our home. We just didn't. Mm -hmm. And so that is something I have had to kind of over the years, just get over and let people come in my house and see it when it's messy and, um, and just be okay with that. And so any of the words that have to do with like those types of topics, I like to write about, but it's also very challenging for me because it's something that I have really had to work hard at um, to, and not just cause I feel like it's one of those things too, where you could do it for a while really well, and then life gets busy and then you stop. Mm -hmm. And then you're six months later and you're like, shoot, we haven't had anybody over for dinner. We haven't invited anybody in. And so it's one of those things that I feel like too, you're continually working on. You never, you never arrive. So, um, those are probably the most challenging words for me. Well, you know, those words are right up my alley and I have a yes. hospitality planner for you. Um, so that you don't forget, because you just have to write it on the calendar. That's uh, awesome. When we first got married, I, my husband was raised in the same kind of family as yours, and I was raised in the opposite. So I was giving him a list of all the people we needed to have over. And I said, these are all the non Christians. And these are all the Christians. And he just we we're on the way to, on our way to church. And he just looked at me and he said, you don't have to invite the whole world. And I thought, well, why not? But I didn't argue because, you know, I was a newlywed and I was trying to be submissive. And I said, well, then let's invite the non-Christians because we'll see the others later. Yeah. So we would just have to put it on the calendar once a month, which was nothing to me, but a lot for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as you know, if you don't, if you don't plan on kindness, it doesn't happen. I love that right. whole thing about making God tangible. Why? By doing acts of kindness. Yeah. Yeah. It's like love does like Bob Goff says. And when I interviewed him, you know what his legacy was being available, which he was, uh. which he was embodying by even answering my phone call. When I said, mm -hmm. well, can I interview you? Who is this again? I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, he was right. just so darling. People go, oh, you right. interviewed Bob Goff. I go, that says everything about him, not about me. And I just want you to know that. What about you, uh, Julie? What word meant the most to you? And thanks for sharing that, Kendra. That was beautiful. I know it's really hard for me to go now because she gave such a great answer. I oh, think wow. my favorite word, so two things. I wrote on a lot of hard words. Because mm. <laughs> you're a lawyer. Know. You're smart. I, well, I don't know. I think I like, I, I don't mind, I don't mind tackling challenges and I know, um, whether we really like it or not, I know that our growth often happens in those hard places and in hard seasons and over hard words. Yes. And so I love me a good party word all day long, but you'll often find me writing about like lament or um, other words that are a little more difficult, require a little bit more wrestling. Um, but my favorite word I think was the word before. Mm. And I told this story, I, I, when I was practicing law, you know, it's a difficult job because there's a lot of really high emotions and sometimes there's really high stakes and people are kind of counting on the attorney to represent them. I mean, you, you know, you're their voice in court. Right. And so I would always, always, always ask God to go before me. And I would always ask that his will be done in the courtroom because he knew, he knew like what needed to happen. And he mm -hmm. knew like the real story behind all of right. the things. And so that was how I coped sometimes with my really stressful cases. And so I told the story of, I mean, not any details, of course, but of course. like this story of God being before us. So like, even as I was walking up to the courtroom door, knowing that he was already inside waiting to meet me mm -hmm. and my clients and all of us. And so I think that was my favorite word and favorite story, but, um, and, and I've just, you know, and I, that was something that I've carried with me my whole life. Like every time you're walking into a really hard space or hard situation that God's already there. Mm -hmm. And I've prayed that over countless people too, that like they would feel his presence as they entered in. You're not alone for a second or even a millisecond. Mm -hmm. I've experienced a little bit in the courtroom and I really uh, experienced how the attorney was the advocate 
And that's what Jesus has called for us. And I wonder if that was that one of your words as well, an advocate. It was not. And I really had never volume two thought of my job <laughs> that way. But you're right. You're right. That's a great word. Okay. Uh, we're going to close this up. But I wanted to know um, is there a new legacy from the last time that we talked? legacy that you've talked about legacy a legacy of hospitality for you Kendra and Julie for you um, still being able to work in young people's lives and showing the real really I think it's so great that you're teaching law to young people as a believer I'm sure you can't talk about Christ in the classroom but to be a light in that area anything any thoughts on that I you know I've been giving a lot of thought lately about just being available um, and, and that I did write one story about my classroom. I linger every day after class. I take a little extra time erasing the blackboard. I just sort of like monkey with the computer for a couple of moments and just pause. I don't rush off because my students come and talk to me after class. And then I invite them up to my office. It's a little more difficult for me to get them to take that first step all the way up to my office, which is just up a set of stairs, but it's a little, there's like some kind of a barrier. Um, but if I linger in that classroom space, I find the most interesting conversations. And so I'm trying to be someone who does that a little bit more just everywhere I go that I'm just available and I just linger for a little bit because interesting things happen in mm. those places. God has got some ability to move there. And that really has everything to do with my last question, which is how do you embody the welcoming heart of God? God lingers every day. Mm -hmm. He's waiting for us to come going mm -hmm. before us. And he has that welcome heart. We just have to open the door, mm -hmm. really, really open the door. I was reading about that this morning in scripture and, and where Jesus knocks, but we have to open the door. So there's really mm -hmm. a, a mutuality of hospitality where we invite God in, but he's already there waiting the before there. Mm -hmm. And um, so any, any other last thoughts on your book or on how you uh, welcome the world um, to God's welcoming heart? Mm -hmm. I think it's being open, like Julie said, being willing to linger. I think Julie and I and Kristen have been very intentional. Um, we live in fairly diverse communities. And so mm -hmm. for us, it's been really, really important as believers to be open to people who might look different than us or be in a different stage of life than we are. Mm -hmm. um, and we're intentional to try to build relationships mm -hmm. with people um, who aren't maybe like us or, or as you said, maybe aren't even believers yet. And I think that that's a really important piece of probably all three of our hearts and legacy and wanting to um, wanting to continue to grow in and, and be comfortable. And I think the older you get, I feel like I, you know, we get more comfortable to just be people who are present and, um, and you see God show up in, in so many of those places. So mm -hmm. I wonder why that has to do with age. Maybe we realized that racing around didn't really get us anywhere fast or that was worthwhile. Well, ladies, you have been a treasure once again, is there anything else you want to leave with our audience? I would just encourage you to be, you know, to be blessed, to be intentional. Um, we always say like, you know, whatever you're pursuing, um, you know, if, if you get off track, it's okay. We all do. And so um, in whatever their, you know, goals are, what they're pursuing, sometimes you look at other people, you listen to them on podcasts and you think, oh my goodness, other people are doing so much and I'm not. Mm -hmm. And it's simply not true. We all have seasons where we maybe get a lot accomplished and others where we don't. And so I would just say, it's okay to be where you are. Mm -hmm. And um, to pick up something maybe that you have left off and, and want to get back to. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And also Mother's Day is around the corner. And I think this book would be an excellent gift. Uh, repeat the title for me again. That tagline is a mouthful. So it say is. It. Say it so, slowly, please, Julie. Okay. So the, the main title is One Good Word a Day. So okay. you can Google or go to your favorite giant retailer online of whichever mm -hmm. name. Um, and just type in one good word a day and you'll, it'll pop up. But the tagline gives you a little bit more just of a glimpse of what it is. 365 invitations to encourage, deepen, and refine your faith. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, that's so great. And I like anything with the word invitation. And I invite you listeners to uh, check out the Ruth Experience, all their books. There are many devotionals, as well as uh, this whole thing about kindness is so intriguing because I think that's that crosses over to the non-believer. Uh, mm-hmm. We are here to shine the light of Christ so that people are attracted to God, not put off by how we act. And so when we act with kindness, we are really uh, showing the world the kind heart of God as well as his welcoming heart. So thank you, ladies, once again, for joining me. God bless. Thank you, Sue.